Kafka on the Shore has to be one of my all-time favourite novels. It's a surrealist masterpiece that only gets better with each subsequent reread. Each time you find something new that can shift your perspective on what the book actually means. And to that end, this video cannot honestly explain Kafka on the Shore because nobody can definitively explain it. This video is instead going to serve as a primer, giving a, an overview of the story and a little bit of the historical context that can help your understanding of the novel. Knowing that no two people will interpret the same story in the same way gives us a framework and mindset to view the novel. It isn't some puzzle where all the pieces click together and make sense. It's a dream, and like dreams, we need to interpret and decipher the information that's given to us. Haruki Murakami said as much in an interview on his website. On this website in the space of three months, I received over 8,000 questions from readers and personally responded to over 1,200 of them. It was a lot of work, but I really enjoyed it. What I concluded from this exchange was that the key to understanding the novel lies in reading it multiple times. This may sound self-serving, but it's true. I know people are busy and it depends too on whether you feel like doing it, but if you have the time, I suggest reading the novel more than once. Things should become clearer the second time around. I've read it, of course, dozens of times as I rewrote it, and each time I did, slowly but surely, the whole started to come into sharper focus. Kafka on the Shore contains several riddles, but there aren't any solutions provided. Instead, several of these riddles combine, and through their interaction, the possibility of a solution takes place. And the form this solution takes will be different for each reader. But to put it another way, the riddles function as part of a solution. It's hard to explain, but that's the kind of novel I set out to write. So even by Murakami's own admission, there is no one way to interpret the novel. So the best I can do at this point is to give you my interpretation of what the novel means. It might not match up to what you think, but that's the amazing thing about this book and why so many people still discuss it even so long after it's been released. But we can start to see when we dive into Murakami's backstory and his origin story of how he became an author that his surrealist style really kind of just bleeds into the core of who he is and it helps us understand how to read Kafka on the Shore. So Murakami's style only becomes more apparent when we dive into this personal backstory. So it all started in 1978. Murakami was at a baseball game for his favorite team, the Yakult Swallows. And there, Murakami watched the American player Dave Hilton hit a double. And apparently, according to Murakami himself, this was the moment when he realized he was destined to become a writer. Not that he thought he would give it a go, or he's like, this is my career path that I'm going to take now. He said that that was the moment he realized he was destined to become a writer. I guess it's up to anyone's interpretation what that means too. Even the man's real life explanations for things that have happened is shrouded in mystery. And that's the perfect way to encapsulate a Murakami story. Because Murakami's books, for the most part, are a mystery. They're not a puzzle. It might sound trivial, but it's another key way to understanding how to read books like Kafka on the Shore. National security expert Gregory Treverton defined the difference between the two. There's a reason millions of people try to solve crossword puzzles each day. Amid the well-ordered combat between the puzzler's mind and the blank boxes waiting to be filled, there is a satisfaction along with frustration. Even when you can't find the right answer, you know it exists. Puzzles can be solved, they have answers. But a mystery offers no such comfort. It poses a question that has no definitive answer. Because the answer is contingent, it depends on the future interactions of many factors, known and unknown. A mystery cannot be answered, it can only be framed by identifying the critical factors and applying some sense of how they have interacted in the past and might interact in the future. A mystery is an attempt to define ambiguities. Decoding Kafka is about interpreting the story's events, even when it seems like those events have no connections and don't make any sense. 
Kafka on the Shore is told through a dual perspective narrative, with two characters seemingly having nothing to do with each other. You have Kafka, a teenage student living with his father in Tokyo, who decides to run away because of an Oedipal prophecy that he would kill his father and sleep with his mother. But in addition to this, the story also follows Satoru Nakata, a man who fell into a coma as a child after what we presume is a supernatural event during World War II. When he regained consciousness, Nakata lost his memories and his ability to read and write, but in exchange, he gained the ability to talk to cats. And it only gets weirder from there. Before we dive into this bizarre and twisted tale with its equally bizarre characters, I'll give a little background to help understand the context behind Kafka on the Shore. So to do that, we need to break down the core story into its two primary narratives to better understand the origins of each. If we were to try and better understand the novel's protagonists, it's best to start with Nakata. And if we're going to start by looking at Nakata, we need to look at his physical, emotional and spiritual standing within the book. Nakata was raised in World War II Japan. He suffered an unexplained incident, which we will get into later. And while within the context of the story, it offers potentially a different meaning, Nakata's response to these events is a physical response to wartime trauma. Murakami himself scratched on this topic for a piece that he wrote in the New Yorker entitled Abandoning the Cat. In it, he spoke about growing up in the Hyogo prefecture of Kansai. In it, he describes the area with a very intriguing passage that gives us a little bit of insight into how he views Japan. I was in one of the lower grades of elementary school at the time, I believe, so probably around 1955 or a little later. Near our home were the ruins of a bank building that had been bombed by American planes, one of the few still visible scars of the war. Even though Murakami was born after World War II, the American occupation didn't end until 1952. During these formative years of Murakami's life, along with the scars both seen and unseen that served as constant reminders all around Japan, the war stayed embedded in the collective Japanese consciousness. Collective trauma being a prominent theme that Murakami himself has explored through many of his novels. But this keen awareness of war's trauma was only made more apparent in Abandoning the Cat when we get to the meat of this article. Murakami discusses his discovery that his father was part of Japan's infamous 20th Infantry Regiment, who took part in the Nanjing Massacre. The 20th Infantry Regiment was known for being one of the first to arrive in Nanjing after the city fell. Military units from Kyoto were generally seen as well-bred and urbane, but this particular regiment's actions gave it a surprisingly bloody reputation. For a long time, I was afraid that my father had participated in the attack on Nanjing, and I was reluctant to investigate the details. He died in August 2008 at the age of 90, without my ever having asked him about it, without his ever having talked about it. For those of you who don't know, the Nanjing Massacre was a particularly bloody chapter in Asian history. Uh, on December 13th, 1937, Japanese forces attacked the Chinese city of Nanjing, a siege that lasted six weeks. Conservative estimates suggest that at least 200,000 counts of murder were committed over these six weeks, with some proposing the murder rate could be even double that. And the weight of that nagging thought in the back of Murakami's brain, that his father could have been part of such a dark stain on history, had traumatic psychological effects on him. As Murakami stated, his father didn't die until six years after the publication of Kafka on the Shore. It seems that Murakami's, albeit distant, brush with such horrific human trauma, as with many people who experience trauma in all its shades, drew him closer to the trauma of others. Not out of morbid obsession, but to better make sense of the dark world we live in. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that going through this experience, Nakata also has strong ties to themes of, of war and the trauma of war. I don't think that that is coincidental. Now in saying that, I can only speculate. After all, the only person who knows for sure is Murakami himself. Still, I believe that Nakata symbolises the trauma war creates, at least as the beginning seed for Nakata's character. 
Obviously, we will dive more into Nakata in the narrative context, but this explanation serves as a good foundation for understanding his character. Which gives us a nice segue into understanding Kafka. Hi guys, just a quick break in our regularly scheduled programming to let you know that in addition to making these videos about Murakami among many other things, I'm also an author and I have a brand new book called Red River which is very much in this same surrealist Murakami-esque style. Uh, it is multiple perspectives, much like Kafka on the Shore, but thematically, I guess it shares some similarities. It's, it's very much stylistically like Kafka on the Shore. It's set in a rural town in Australia, and when a 22-year-old woman goes missing, it scratches this perfect veneer of the country town, and we start to see that, that there's some pretty messed up stuff going on. And I've also tried to play with formatting and how you consume the book and real life things that are tagged outside of the novel itself. So trying a few experimental things. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, then by all means, please check the link out, have a look at it and let me know what you think. Um, but I've bothered you enough now, so I will get straight back into our regularly scheduled programming. Having already uncovered the distance between Murakami and his father, it's possible to see Kafka as an allegory for the relationship with his father, an extension of those unspoken worries and conversations that they would never have. There's no concrete evidence to support this theory, but if you're coming to this book expecting answers that might tie everything up in a neat little box, you might have picked the wrong book. But Kafka's character can be better understood by diving into two very different texts. The first will help us understand the narrative, and the second will help us understand the novel as a whole and give us another contextual clue as to how Murakami expects us to read it. So, as we begin the tale, which we will go into in greater detail in the next episode of this series, we open with Kafka Tamura running away from home because his father declared a prophecy that Kafka would kill him and sleep with his mother. As I'm sure most of you are aware, particularly if you have seen my other videos on the subject, this is a clear and conscious connection that Murakami has made to Sophocles and the Greek tragedy of Oedipus Tyrannus, known in English as Oedipus Rex. There are many similarities to the opening of the story. It serves as a launching pad for the actual story itself. The whole of Kafka on the Shore does not follow the same narrative path, but it gives us something surreal to latch onto. And also something that represents that unspoken relationship between father and son, which we had previously mentioned. Something that makes sense within the narrative. For those of you who don't know, the story of Oedipus Rex has the same prophecy uh, unfolding within Kafka on the Shore of you're going to kill your father and sleep with your mother. And of course, the titular Oedipus, the mythical king of Thebes, he obviously thinks this is not going to happen, and then unwittingly, he actually fulfills the prophecy. So this gives us an interesting discussion that we can have, but we can't really have it until we have finished the book. But framing the opening of this story through the Oedipal Prophecy is an interesting technique because when we get to the end, we can discuss as to whether we think that it's a repetition of that classic tale, or is it subverting that tale and he hasn't fulfilled that prophecy, uh, and it goes off on a different direction. So that is entirely up to interpretation, which if you've read the book you'll understand, but if you're reading along with this series, you're not going to get a concrete answer at the end. But I have thoughts on it, but I think that it would make more sense if we share that at the end of this series. As I said before, we'll leave that conversation to the end of the series, but it brings us to the second text, which I would argue is the most important component of Kafka's character, and the novel itself, his name. Obviously, Kafka is not a common name in Japan, so it sparks interest in the character from the beginning, but I think his name has much deeper undertones that speak more to the novel itself. I don't think it was just some random 
choice to say, hey, here's a weird name for the sake of having a weird name. I think that there is a very conscious decision being made as to the naming of that character and the name of his imaginary friend character, Crow, but we'll get to that later. Because unlike in this breakdown, we are not introduced to the character of Nakata first. It is Kafka that we first meet, and I believe that this helps set the tone for the entire novel and gives us clues as to what kind of story we can expect. Kafka is named after Franz Kafka, a Czechoslovakian author who has a very distinctive style. And he is also a writer whom Murakami has cited as one of his biggest inspirations. Kafka's works are known for finding the absurd and surreal in the mundane, highlighting how ridiculously complicated and, and absurd life is, particularly looking at the monotonous bureaucracy, which stemmed from Kafka's early years as an insurance clerk. We even get hints of this in the novel's beginning, with Kafka's home life in his quote-unquote stable state of the story. He constantly goes to the gym and to school following these monotonous patterns. But the connection to Franz Kafka goes so much deeper than that because it's worth noting that Kafka's stories often devolve into a dreamlike, disorienting, illogical state. This helps the reader understand the kind of story that they're getting into. One that may not give all the answers because it is a mystery, not a puzzle. It requires interpretation, not understanding, which is why I'm easing you in with some understandings of the characters before we go into the full-on interpretations of things. Which brings me to one of my final points about this book, which is, what kind of book is it? This is not the kind of book that you can just slap a singular label on that might describe the book, um, though plenty of booksellers have tried. Like all good Kafkaesque stories, this one is hard to put in a single box. Sure, it has a mystery component, but it also has horror and romance thrown in too. I mean, it's impossible to attach one singular label that might describe the book, but the label of magical realism is the best that I can think of myself to perfectly encapsulate what the story is about. And when we look at it through the lens of magical realism, we have to understand that there are pillars of magical realism stories and and two of the biggest pillars feature very prominently in here and that is dream logic and manipulation of time some of you have already pointed out in the comment section of previous videos this subject but it is worth noting that this is a key component to understanding my interpretation of the novel so i think it's just worth mentioning at this point but i think that brings me to my final point in episode zero before we really dive into this book there is just so much to experience in this book you may only get a small fraction of the story when you first read it and Murakami didn't write it expecting that you would I have had some people in the comments thinking that they aren't smart enough to understand this book but I think it just comes down to people coming to the novel with the wrong mindset this isn't the kind of book you consume in an afternoon and then instantly forget. It's a kind of world you return to and ruminate on what it means. And my favourite part of this book is the part that makes so many people so frustrated with it. And that's that there is enough story that it doesn't seem disconnected or, or just weird for the sake of weird but there's also enough ambiguity in the novel that it can mean different things to different people, and that's okay. What I'm sharing with you in this series is just one interpretation of the novel, and that's what makes Kafka on the Shore feel so unique. That's what keeps people going back and rereading. So if you are coming to this book for the first time, just dive into it and let the story just wash over you and enjoy all the weird and wonderful elements, even if the jigsaw pieces don't click together and make sense. And just remember that they may never actually do that at all. Even if all the jigsaw pieces don't instantly click together and make sense. As a piece of surrealist fiction, it is meant to be consumed like a dream with the understanding that we may never actually comprehend all of what the story has to say because I guess the irony is that if we were given the answers that we apparently crave so much 
we would move on from the story very quickly and forget about it. The questions and ever-changing interpretations are what bring us back to this book. And maybe you think I'm full of crap, I don't know, but let me know down in the comments what you think of the book. Have you read it? Are you considering reading it? Have I changed your mind one way or the other based on what you've heard here. Let me know down in the comments below. I'd love to talk to you about this book. I'd love to hear where you are with this book. Have you just heard of it, picked it up, or are you a seasoned traveler? I'd also love to hear how you approach the book, uh, with scholarly precision or simply soak it up like a sponge. Again, the same as the interpretation, there's no one way of doing it, so let me know how you approach the book. And I am so excited right now. I cannot wait to be back here with you guys talking about Murakami, talking about Kafka on the Shore. Also, if I could ask a huge favor, could you please share this channel with anybody you think might enjoy decoding and discussing any kind of weird and surreal fiction? And remember to subscribe to stay updated on the release dates for the latest episodes. Until then, stay weird, and I will catch you guys in the next video.